Hello, in this episode of Cool Grand Videos, we're going to talk about MBA in marketing. Marketing is a very interesting subject. Companies all over the world spend millions of dollars in marketing budget to run marketing campaigns to truly understand consumer psychology, to provide the consumers what really they expect from the companies. Marketing is an important component for any product or services company. And uh, I took a lot of marketing courses in my MBA and I'm going to tell you about what courses you study in an MBA in marketing and what the prospects are, what career paths you can follow after you do your MBA and how to excel. So first of all, what is marketing? Marketing is a management process which helps to you know, transform goods and services to take it from the concept to the ideation and incubation to the market, to the end customer. So it's um, the coordination of four elements. They are called the four P's of marketing. That is the product, the price, the place, and the promotional strategy. So first of all, we need to identify, select, and develop the right product for the right market. So we need to do a market analysis, understand what people's needs are, and develop the right products to address their needs. And then we determine its price. So you don't want to underplay. I mean, there is something called like antitrust. You can't just play below the market rate. And if you charge too low, you won't make a good profit. There are so many other factors that come into determining a price. And if you charge too high, people might just go with the competitor. So you just have to determine the right price for each market. And then there's the, you have to select the right distributed channel to get the product at, across to the customer's place. You have to be there at the right time, at the right place. Suppose you develop a product in a particular city and all the customers are in various other cities of the country and they think it's not worth going to this particular city to get the product. They're just not probably going to buy your product or they might buy an imitation product in their own city, a local brand which is not as good. So it's important to be at the right place at the right time. And then there's a promotional strategy. You got to advertise the right amount in the right way at the right time. There is a whole topic about how to launch a product, when to launch it, to which audience to release it, and you know all these trade secrets and things like that. So marketing is really a very interesting subject, and I'm going to tell you some really interesting case studies that I've you know come across in marketing. So if you do an MBA in marketing, what are the typical courses that you would study? Uh, these are some of the courses. Now, international marketing, product innovation, consumer psychology, brand building and management, how to run marketing campaigns, product launching, competitor analysis, how to conduct surveys, advertising, and statistical analysis. These are like some of the courses that you study typically in any MBA program. And let's take a look at what international marketing is all about. Some universities, you know, focus on international marketing, like the Thunderbird School of Global Management that's like really famous for, you know, how to help people and managers to make decisions across the national boundaries. If you're taking a product to launch globally, you need to consider so many cultural factors and, you know, so many financial factors, political factors in so many regions to make it successful worldwide. So international marketing is all about like how a company in a particular country would like to take its products out to all the other countries and other markets to make it successful across many countries. So if a company is planning to branch into another country or region, the company needs to consider various factors about the new country where they're planning to set foot. So first they have to study the demand and supply in the country. And then they have to think about cultural differences. And you know, sometimes what sells really well in Japan may not sell well in India, and what sells really well in India may not sell well in America. So it depends on the consumer psychology of that particular region. They have to think about how cooperative and stable the nation's government is. You don't want to get stuck with a government that is really fickle and who's not able to make the right decisions and who's struggling with all its coalition partners and there's no political stability if there's a lot of political unrest, it's unlikely that they're going to help you be successful in that country. And we need to understand the political situation. The, uh, we need to do an extensive market study. 
So think about what the people really want. What is their current situation? What are their pain points? Convince them that you're there to help them and address their pain points. So it takes a lot of research to foray into a new marketplace. We also have to think about geographical and weather conditions. And then we have to think about labor laws. If you're setting up a new company and opening a new branch in a particular country, you have to think about their local laws. So I'm going to elaborate about these using a lot of case studies that we've studied. So let's take the interesting case of McDonald's and KFC. So, you know, McDonald's and KFC, that's Kentucky Fried Chicken, they're both uh, fast food uh, chain restaurants. And so, uh, in the 1990s sometime, both McDonald's and KFC tried to venture into India. McDonald's put in a lot of effort to do a cultural analysis of, you know, the Indian market. And they were a big success the way they portrayed themselves. And KFC did not assess the Indian consumer needs or psychology correctly, they were a big failure. In fact, KFC had to retreat from India, they had to close shop. In fact, some of the farmers' organizations, they smeared cow dung on their windows and destroyed their offices and outlets, and they had to close shop and retreat. And then they had to come back again after doing a revised analysis. So, what McDonald's did right? So, McDonald's was popular in America and the West, and now they're thinking about, you know, selling food in India. So, they had to get all the permissions and, you know, from the governments, which they did. And then, they did not want to hurt the Hindu or Muslim sentiments. As you know, more than, almost like 80% of the Indian population is Hindu. And they have a lot of uh, reverence for cows. They don't eat beef or any kind of cow products. And they didn't want to hurt Muslim sentiments either. You know, Muslims don't eat any kind of pig products like pork or beef or, uh, sorry, pork or ham or bacon. So, McDonald's took care not to introduce any product that would hurt people's religious sentiments. So, no beef, no pork, no ham, no bacon in their burgers or their sandwiches or their products. So, uh, they used only initially chicken and maybe lamb. So, and they also, they wa wanted to... Uh, you know, convince the vegetarians that this restaurant is vegetarian friendly. So they had separate oil, cooking oil for vegetarians and for non-vegetarian products. So they had, um, you know, french fries cooked separately and uh, chicken nuggets cooked separately in different uh, places in the kitchen. And they convinced the vegetarians that it was quite safe for them to eat in McDonald's. They also provided a lot of job opportunities for thousands of Indian youth. And, you know, suppose uh, a particular political leader or somebody wants to, you know, campaign against McDonald's, but then there are people in his extended family or people in his neighborhood who are working at McDonald's and they say, hey, that's our bread and butter. Then they are less likely to protest against McDonald's. So they started giving job opportunities to lo local youth. And McDonald's also tried to create a cool brand image. They appeared cool to youth. It seemed like a fashion statement to be able to go and eat at McDonald's. And the golden arches, their um, symbol was also very popular. Their pricing strategy also worked with the masses. They didn't like overprice. Like, you know, some companies, even food companies, they charge a lot of money. Like I've seen especially pizza companies, they charge a lot of money, almost like the same price it costs for a pizza in the United States. It's actually quite high in the Indian market, but some of people are, you know, able to pay it, I guess. McDonald's did not overcharge. They tried to keep their pricing low too. So, after they did all this market research and did an extensive study of cultural differences in India, McDonald's actually proved to be very successful in India. So let's take a look at what KFC did wrong. So Kentucky Fried Chicken. So when they came here, a lot of farmers stopped growing uh, crops which provided food for people and instead they started growing chicken feed because they thought KFC would give them more money for the chicken feed that they grew. And uh, the KRRS, that's a Karnataka Rajya Raita Sangha, that's an association of farmers. They started attacking KFC. 
they broke their windows and they smeared cow dung on their store and they said KFC was you know ruining our culture Indian culture and they were somehow um, forcing all these farmers to produce chicken feed instead of crops for people which they thought is not good for society and a lot of people thought we need more multinational companies to teach us IT to develop products and to develop services to make the world a better place they said we don't need KFC to teach us how to fry a chicken and KFC was also attacked severely by animal rights organizations like PETA and SPCA so many organizations they alleged cruelty to these chicken so these chicken were um, uh, cooked up in uh, tiny cages and um, their beaks were you know cut off in a very cruel way to prevent them from picking at each other and uh, they were force fed they were uh, injected with hormones and given much more food than they really must get and so these chicken grew to be terribly overweight and uh, they had uh, such terrible hormonal disorders and they could barely stand on their feet and they were killed in the most cruel ways they were ground alive and you know all these things so KFC was branded unhealthy as well and there were videos about how they took the chicken and threw them here and there and broke their bones and you know it was really heart wrenching so there was resistance from people they said hey we need more multinationals which improve our society by helping us develop products and services we don't need them to teach us how to fry a chicken we can do that ourselves you know that kind so the people resisted it the you know the lay people resisted it and then the animal welfare organizations opposed it and then the farmers associations opposed it and the indian patriots thought we shouldn't encourage this kind of multinational companies to come to india and they thought it's somehow opposing indian culture so kfc ran into tremendous losses they had to close shop because they didn't do their entry right they had to retreat and then after a few years they revised their uh, international marketing strategy and they somehow got back into india so that was an interesting case study about mcdonalds and kfc so in international marketing we think about how to implement a product worldwide for example if intel has a company in santa clara or portland in the united states and they're thinking about venturing abroad they think the labor costs are too high in uh, the united states so they have to make a decision about whether to go to india or china they have to think about the cost of the land they have to think about the government the political situation and the labor laws and the quality of work that they can get and then the communication skills indians may speak better english maybe their english is more understandable chinese sometimes have an accent problem and it's sometimes difficult to understand uh, the english they talk so they have to think about all these cultural religious and um, social political factors and not to mention the profits and loss and then they have to make a decision for example should we establish another unit in the united states itself or should we go to india or should we go to china and if we decide to go to india for example they might as well use the services of a company that's already in india which can work with the government officials you know overcome all the bureaucracy and red tape and help them get all the permits and the land and set up the building and then hand it over to intel for example so that they can come and take over the operations so they have to think about all these international marketing factors so in mba we had a lot of interesting case studies about international marketing and it was really really fascinating so product innovation is the next topic so there were a lot of courses about product innovation there may be simple products like a chair or a shopping cart or a television or a light bulb anything that you can think about from a very simple product to a more complex product like a smartphone or um, a mercedes car so these are all different products and we think about how to make it more innovative so that it's more useful and appealing to society with new features so students create prototypes and we incubate the products we try and brainstorm ideas to make products better consumer psychology is very important in designing new products for example um i've seen a lot of interesting innovations happen like in america and also other countries 
simple things which can be made better and to make life easier and more comfortable. For example, snuggies. Snuggies are also called slackets or you know blankets with sleeves. In one MBA class in sub course, the students were asked to come up with something innovative. Think about an everyday product and make it more useful. So they thought about how when they're when it's cold and you're sitting on your bed or your couch trying to read a book or you know work on your iPad, your hands get all cold and your blanket is slipping away. So they came up with the idea of blankets with sleeves. So you put your hands in the sleeves and then your hands stay warm and the blanket doesn't fall off. So this woman's got her um, hands in the sleeves and she's happily reading a book. So a blanket with sleeves, isn't that cool? That's a Snuggie. I have a Snuggie and I love my Snuggie, so... Snuggies were an interesting invention. It's about everyday products that can be made much more useful. And then the shopping cart. So there was this company called IDEO that worked on redesigning the shopping cart. So the current shopping cart, if you see, uh, there's not much uh, provision for like children to sit in. You have to make them sit in the top of the cart and it's not like very comfortable for them that uh, reduces the space you have for your other products and then there is no compartmentalization so all your groceries if you go to the grocery store you buy everything and put it in one place but in this revised shopping cart that they created they had compartments like one for the frozen section one for the dairy products and one for your vegetables and something like that and this, they also had a place where you could put your coffee cup and this was an easy kind of a um, small chair, a seat kind of thing for putting your child in there. And it was supposed to be much more lightweight, much more easy to maneuver and um, this shopping cart design was actually much more uh, comfortable and useful than the conventional shopping carts. So IDEO worked on this, this company IDEO, they designed this new shopping cart. So they also had less chances of items falling off the cart. That's another useful feature they had. So in product innovation, we think about everyday products and how we can make them better. It's actually a very interesting subject and I really enjoyed that course. So the next thing you study about in marketing is how to run marketing campaigns. Now suppose there is a medical devices company and they are producing um, hearing aids and they're producing pacemakers and they're producing uh, you know uh, devices that help you monitor your blood pressure and they're you know introducing devices that help you monitor your blood sugar and you know so many interesting devices and if they want to run a marketing campaign to you know popularize their products so it has to be a very well defined marketing campaign with a budget allotted to it and targets and how to measure the return on investment. For example, they might give $10,000 to their marketing manager and say, there's going to be this uh, huge medical devices conference in uh, Los Angeles and you have to go there and set up a stall and distribute flyers and you know, say, employ about three or four people from the company to you know, talk to people, give them your visiting cards, explain the products to them and uh, get their cards in return, get their contacts and try and reach out to them with follow-up emails and phone calls and try and convert leads into prospects, into opportunities and finally take deals to closure. So a lead is like anyone who is probably interested, who comes there and says, hey, you know what, I'd like to know more. That, or you know, he gives you his visiting card, that's a lead. So you, a lead becomes a prospect when he probably takes a demo of your products. So the next thing is you reach out to him, set up an appointment and you showcase your products to them. That's called like pre-sales. So showcase your product to them and explain it to them. They take a demo and maybe they might purchase the product later or not. So now at the now they're called like prospects. And then it becomes an opportunity when you get into like negotiations, discussing the pricing and discussing um, the discounts and uh, discussing uh, how to customize the product for their company. At that stage, it's like under negotiation. The opportunity is under negotiation. And then finally when they give you a purchase order, it becomes a closed deal. The deal is taken to closure. So 
So for a marketing campaign to be successful, we have to set something called KPIs. KPIs are key performance indicators. So if they're giving this marketing manager a budget of $10,000, he spends about $1,000 to set up the stall. He spends another $2,000 to print out flyers and give business cards out. And then that's $3,000 gone. So the remaining money, how is he going to spend it? Maybe he's going to give them freebies. He's going to give them pens and uh, diaries and all these items which uh, make them you know, kind of interested to uh, come to their stall and take a look at their products. And then maybe he's going to spend some time traveling to customer sites and making demos and you know, presentations. So how he uses the $10,000 is it has to be done in a very well thought out manner and at the end of it he has to get maybe he gets about um, uh, 3500 visiting cards and he gets the gets to collect the email ids of about 2000 people and he has to send out follow up emails to all these people make phone calls and out of those 3500 uh, visiting cards and 2000 emails maybe about um, 800 people are interested to take a demo of the product and then he gives the demos to you know about 800 people and then only about 300 people are interested to follow up with further uh, pricing and you know uh, negotiation about you know the customization and further discussions and then they discuss further with the marketing team the sales team reaches out to these people and then they discuss further and out of these 300 people maybe only about 100 people will actually uh, take this really seriously and out of them, only 80 of them might actually take this to closure. So that particular marketing campaign got this company 80 new deals, 80 purchase orders. So what was the total revenue that they got from these 80 closures? For example, suppose they were able to generate a revenue of about um, $90,000 and they invested $10,000 for this marketing campaign. Well, that's probably successful. So but if they got a return on investment of only like $25,000 and they spent $10,000, mm, maybe they're happy, but if they spent $10,000 and they got less than that in terms of revenue from this marketing campaign within a period of one or two years, then they got to think about how to do it better next time and uh, do they really have the budget to keep on spending on marketing uh, if they're not getting enough return on investment. They have to think about all these things. So how much time was spent on the campaign? How much revenue did they generate from it? And this is all about how to run marketing campaigns effectively. Sometimes they have all these fascinating ideas and everything, but the people they employ at the stall, you know, to reach out to customers, they're not friendly or they're very snobbish or they're not interested to, you know, actively reach out to people. That's enough to screw up the marketing campaign. So you have to think about so many ways in which the campaign has to be run to make it successful. So marketing pipeline, this is uh, these are some of the standard terminologies we use in sales and marketing. Uh, leads, prospects, opportunities, closures. So uh, we already talked about those. Uh, leads, you know, who are interested to take uh, a demo become like prospects, prospects who are seriously negotiating and customizing the uh, deal, they become opportunities and then they become closures. These are usually industry standard terminologies. So Another important course you study in marketing is consumer psychology. A lot of people from a psychology undergraduate background study MBA in marketing. And there are people from other backgrounds too. But um, consumer psychology is really the key. You have to design products that the consumer feels like buying. Even if the consumer has pain points and you have an excellent product that addresses their pain points, if the consumer psychology is somehow not convinced that this product is going to help them or it's worth buying it, they're not going to buy it. So, consumer psychology is all about understanding what the consumer really wants, what their pain points are. If you ask them, maybe they won't tell you directly. So there are so many other tricks, you know, you can create surveys, make them play a game and, you know, have them answer some questions, or make them write a story. There are so many research techniques and focus groups which are designed explicitly to elicit information from various consumer factions. So you try to really understand what's in the consumer mind by making them subconsciously reveal what really is in their mind. 
you'll be amazed to know that a lot of people have things going on in their minds that they would never agree as true, but it's true. So I've got to uh, demonstrate some really interesting case studies about what the consumer psychology really was. The key point is consumers don't like to always admit about what they really want. You have to somehow get it out of them. That's a very interesting thing, isn't it? So a lot of companies, including top-notch companies like Apple or Intel or Microsoft, they spend millions and millions of dollars every year in marketing, They're conducting surveys, running marketing campaigns, trying to understand consumer psychology, getting feedback, because they want to design products that the consumer really relates to. So for example, uh, think about a simple thing like a body wash. So there's a liquid body wash and the consumer might purchase one particular brand of body wash over the others simply because he likes the shape of the bottle or he likes the picture of the flower on the bottle or he likes the shape of the lid. If you ask him, he's never going to admit it, but that might be true. There's one particular brand that's selling five times better than the competitors simply because the people like the shape of their bottle. It happens all the time. Even though there's another body wash that's really nice, really good, whatever, if it's not packaged well, or simply because the shape of the lid of that bottle is not as nice as another one, people may just not buy it. It's that serious. So, for example, if you think about like a smartphone, uh, whether it's an iPhone or um, an Android or whatever phone, so uh, most lay people, they go to the stores, they may not be very tech savvy and even if they are very tech savvy, sometimes they just pick a smartphone because they like the size, the ratio of the length to breadth or they like the sleekness, the color or the rounded edges or the shape of a particular button. That might be the most critical factor which makes them decide whether to buy a Samsung phone or an LG phone or a Nokia phone or an iPhone they might make that decision simply because they like the look of a particular button or they like the color of the phone. But if you ask them, they say, hey, no, 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 I'm very tech savvy and it's got all these cool features and it's got this uh, huge, uh, nice ca you know, uh, uh, camera and it's got a, a very advanced, uh, you know, multitasking features and it's got a, a very um, advanced uh, Wi-Fi and all these interesting features. But he really might have made the decision simply because he likes the shape of this particular button. It's round instead of square. That might have been the factor which made him choose this particular phone over another one. If you ask him, he's never going to admit it, but that really might have been the case. You really have to dig into consumer psychology to understand what's going on in their mind. For example, this is an interesting case study we had in our MBA. It's about the cockroach trap. So, you know, a lot of women, I think it was in the United States, so they complained that when they sprayed uh, medicine on the cockroaches and had all these traps, uh, these cockroaches would eat the poison and they consume the poison and then they would keep like, you know, lying on their backs and, you know, swarming and suffering and they would die a very tragic death. And all these women, mostly homemakers, they complained that it wasn't enjoyable for them to watch these cockroaches, like hundreds of them squirm and die. They felt disgusted. They said they didn't enjoy, you know, watching them suffer and die. So there was this uh, company that designed a cockroach trap. So it was like, they designed a, like, almost like a black box. So it was like a box with a lid and it had a brush in the front or something like that. And there was some kind of uh, an attractive, uh, poisonous substance inside. So the cockroaches would get enticed by the smell and uh, the uh, fragrance, uh, I mean, the, the smell of that particular substance and they would all go inside this black box. And they would go there and consume the poison and die. And these women never had to watch the cockroaches suffer and die. And this company thought that this cockroach trap would sell millions and would be a big hit because that's what women said they wanted. They didn't want to watch them suffer and die. They would just take the trap and like throw it out or something. But the company was surprised that this cockroach trap did not sell well at all. Very few people actually bought it.
So then they ran a kind of a feedback consumer research survey. So it's kind of really surprising, right? The women said they didn't want to watch the cockroaches suffer and die, and that solves the problem, but they didn't buy this product. So let's try and see what really was going on. So they invited a lot of women to a, like a focus group and um, they asked them to write stories about what they really feel when they see the cockroaches and when they use the trap and when they see them suffer and squirm and die, what really comes to their mind. They asked them to write a story about that. They asked them to draw pictures. So all these women drew pictures of male cockroaches. So all the cockroaches in their diagrams, their pictures were all male. And some of these women, they were asked to give a name to the cockroach, what really comes in their mind. So they named the cockroaches, like Peter, Andy, uh, David, whatever. They gave them names. And uh, when they somehow made like a picture of a smiling woman who was enjoying watching this cockroach suffer and die. And the company then tried and identified who these men were. So they asked this woman, hey, you, you named the cockroach uh, Peter. Who is Peter? And they said, oh, he was my ex-boyfriend who was really mean or rough or something like that. And then they realized that a lot of these women somehow identified these cockroaches with the men in their lives who had abused them and exploited them in some way. And when they sprayed medicine on this cockroach and when they watched the cockroach squirm and suffer and die, they somehow felt that those men were suffering and dying and it gave them a lot of psychological relief. That was what was really going on. Isn't that like surprising? A lot of these women in the heart of hearts, like they really enjoyed making the cockroaches suffer because they somehow felt that they were getting back at those men. So the company now understood why the product wasn't selling really well. So then they re redesigned their product. So they made a transparent glass lid for the same product. So there was a box with a, a poisonous substance inside and the same design but with a transparent glass lid. So the cockroaches would all go there and the women could watch them squirm and suffer and die. But it wasn't disgusting for them to clean it because they just had to take it and empty it outside. And then the cockroach trap became a big hit. See, if you ask the women what really was in their mind, they would never consciously tell you, you know what, I enjoy making them suffer and die. That would make them look silly or whatever. But this really was what was going on in their minds. So consumer psychology in marketing is all about trying to dig into the consumer's mind and see what really is going on there and getting it, the information subconsciously extracted from the consumer without his or her knowledge. Another important course in marketing is about how to conduct surveys. When you conduct a survey, there's a whole course about this. You have to ask the right kind of questions so that you don't sway the customer to answer the way you would like them to answer. You have to make them answer what really is in their mind. Try and extract the facts, the absolute reality. You have to make sure you don't influence their opinion. For example, you can't ask a question in a survey which says, how did you like our um, new uh, smartphone? Was it um, average, good, uh, great, excellent? You have to have options which say it was very bad, bad, neutral, above average or good. So you have to balance it up. And then sometimes the way the questions in a survey are worded makes the consumer feel like giving you better feedback than they really want to. So we have to avoid these traps. You have to ask them questions in an impersonal way so that the consumer gives them exact answers about what really they felt. So it's all about how to ask the right questions in a survey. So you also have to think about who must be the target audience for surveys. You have to pick the right sample of the set in the society. And then among all the people in the society, you think about who are, you take like a random sampling from each faction of society. And then you make them the representative sample. And then you say, uh, based on your experiences, how was the experience? and how long or short surveys must be. 
if you give people too long a survey, they're gonna just bored. They they're gonna get so bored. They're just gonna answer whatever they like, and then they're just gonna hand it over to you without putting any thought into it. You don't want that to happen. You don't want to make them bored. You don't want to make them overwhelmed. And at the same time, you don't want to give a very short survey either because that doesn't give you all the information that you need. You have to ask the most important and relevant questions in the right order, in the right way, without swaying or influencing their decision in any way. Conducting surveys is a very complex and challenging task. It's not as easy as many people think it is. So this is another important course you study in marketing. Brand management. How company images and brands are created. How company brands are valued. How to boost your product's brand over competitors. Now, for example, there's this company called Empower Research. You can check out their website, empowerresearch.com. It's an example of a company that profiles various companies and performs brand management and competitor analysis and helps them understand where they really stand. It's about company profiling. So they reach out to all these customers and um, do a competitor analysis. So this is what your competitor is doing. Um, among all these factors, this is how you weigh against your different competitors. And they do something like a SWOT analysis and stuff. And then they also um, see how the company's brand is performing and how to boost the brand value. So uh, they try and tell the companies what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong and how they can do it better. So brand management is a very complex topic. It involves, you know, running marketing campaigns, consumer psychology, and you know, trying to make the customer feel great about this brand. This is what brand management uh, primarily encompasses, and it's like a very complex subject. It requires years and years of experience to perform really good brand management. For example, suppose there was a company called um, Mountain Light Beer. For example, suppose it was a company in um, a rural area and all the people in the area somehow, especially the older generation, related very well to that company. So they, suppose they had a kind of uh, beer called Mountain Beer, okay? And suppose that beer was really bitter and strong and designed for all these laborers who slog all day and they're really tired and sweaty and, you know, they feel really manly and muscular and they feel uh, really great when they drink this uh, really bitter, strong mountain beer. Suppose it's uh, doing very well in its own market and it's the number one beer company in that area. Suppose uh, the CEO of that company retires and his young son, who has got an MBA from a foreign university, comes back and he decides to take over the operations of the company and he says, you know what, I'm going to try and introduce a new kind of beer called Mountain Light. So that's going to be a very light kind of beer that's going to appeal to like maybe women and children and youngsters, not necessarily to laborers alone. We can expand our market. So the people, laborers who want to buy Mountain Beer, the strong version, the bitter one, they can still continue to buy that. And the others can continue to buy the light version of Mountain Beer. And a lot of his advisors actually would advise this young CEO not to introduce Mountain Light because that would somehow dilute the brand image of the company. All the old timers, they would get somehow disgruntled. They associate this company, they have a lot of sentimental value attached to it and they associate it with strong, you know, bitter beer. And if there's a new version that's going to, uh, you know, somehow dilute the beer, it would also dilute the brand image of the company and people are going to get mad. A lot of old timers and regular customers are going to resent it and they might stop buying modern beer anymore. So we have to think about how many people are there in the old timers market and if you do introduce the modern light beer, how well is it going to compete against the other light beers available and how many youngsters are actually going to start using it and uh, how are they going to feel about it. They have to do an extensive consumer survey before they introduce a product. The product may be great, but it might not sell well because of all these psychological factors involved. So many times, companies like these, they refrain from introducing lighter version of beer or products. They have a particular type of brand that they've created and they have to stick to it. So another interesting case study was about the Clorox bleaching agent. So, 
Clorox is a very popular bleach and it's known for its characteristic foul odor. So Clorox company a few years back they introduced a kind of uh, flavor of Clorox bleach minus the foul smell. So it would you know bleach the floor, bleach the clothes, bleach whatever uh, without leaving the undesirable smell, the odor. And they thought, hey, this is going to be really successful because people uh, can now can bleach their, uh, you know, surfaces and they can bleach their clothes, whatever, without that, you know, annoying smell. Hey, this is going to sell like millions of products. But then it didn't take off well at all because people somehow associated a good bleach with the characteristic odor. And they thought if there is no odor, a good bleaching job hasn't been done. So people didn't feel like buying this bleach. They thought, hey, I don't know if this is really doing its job. In their minds, if there was a good bleach that had happened, it had to have the odor. So Clorox actually, I think they discontinued this new version of this uh, Clorox without the odor. Another important topic you study in marketing is competitor analysis. You must always be aware of what your competitors are doing and you must learn to stay one step ahead of them. Brand management companies like Empower Research provide extensive client profiling and competitive anal competitor analysis. There are so many other ways to do competitor analysis. For example, I remember in the year 2004 when I was a very young grad student. Uh, in those days, you know, email storage was just about 5 or 6 MB like Yahoo Mail, Rediff Mail, in those days we didn't have a Gmail so Yahoo and Rediff they had only about 5 or 6 MB storage so we had to have a few emails and keep deleting them all the time to save space and then suddenly one day uh, Yahoo said we're gonna give you 100 MB storage and we were surprised and on the same day Rediff Mail introduced 1 GB storage so even if Rediff had delayed by one day, they would lose quite a few customers who would switch to Yahoo. And if Yahoo had delayed by one day, they would switch a few customers to Rediff. So they had to be aware of what the other person is doing, the other company is doing, competitor analysis. And they both launched this cool, you know, storage on the same day. And it's the same with any other product or company. If you don't launch at the right time, you lose the you lose a segment of your customers because the other company had something called the first mover advantage. So they were first in the market, some people just go to them. Statistical analysis is another interesting tool. There are tools like SPSS and other tools which do various complex statistical calculations and derivations. For example, they try to help you understand the correlations between product sales. For example, if a lot of people are buying potato chips, those people also are likely to buy beer or soda drinks along with the chips and the same with popcorn because chips and popcorn are salty and then along with that you need either like orange juice or soda or uh, mineral water or beer or something like that so these sales go hand in hand and if people buy TVs they are likely to buy a TV stand or some furniture for their house so we do complex correlations between various sales and then they can have packaging like you know if you buy a TV, you get the stand for a discounted price. And if you buy uh, potato chips, you can, you know, at least in the store where they are selling potato chips and, um, you know, uh, like beer, they can at least place them next to each other. So it makes it easy for customers to find them. So the sophisticated automated software tools help identify various complex relationships between variables and product sales and so many other factors which help companies determine how much of a product to produce, how to uh, distribute it, and where to sell it, and how this product is selling with other products. How many salesmen to employ? Large chains of stores like Walmart, Ikea, Best Buy, and uh, so many of these stores need to determine exactly how many salesmen to employ in their store. 
if they employ too many salesmen, because these are companies which have potentially hundreds of stores across the country. Even if they employ one additional salesman per store, that's like 100 employees and it costs them a lot of money to pay these employees and retain them. But instead, if they employ too few salesmen, then the people like customers are going to complain that they don't have enough people to help them and they probably will go to their competitors. So they have to employ exactly the right number of salesmen in the store. So they have all these sections, right? Like for example at Best Buy in America, they have uh, sections for um, selling mobile phones, sections for selling uh, televisions, uh, sections for music, and they have sections for uh, home theaters and laptops and so many other sections. In each section they have to determine how many salesmen to employ. This is a question that makes a difference of like potentially millions of dollars for the company. So a company like Best Buy might engage a few marketing analysts with PhDs in statistical analysis to determine how many salesmen to employ in their stores, depending on the size of the store and all these complex variables. It's a very serious calculation. So uh, these are kind of things where marketing analysts reach out and help. They also find the correlation between various variables and sales and how the salesmen are influencing sales, and all these complex factors. Another interesting um, subject you study in marketing is advertising. So advertising is about how a company encourages people to buy their products. An advertisement, ad for short, is anything that draws good attention towards these things. It is usually designed by an advertising agency for an identified sponsor and performed through a variety of media. Some famous advertising agencies like Ogilvy & Mather produce very creative ads. Advertising is actually not as easy as many people think it is. It's very complex to convey the right message to right people. And you have to use a lot of tricks like sometimes humor, sometimes getting celebrities to endorse your products and sometimes you have to uh, use a lot of creativity in the ads in order to make it appeal to masses. So I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of poorly designed ads. Well, at least it's going to make you smile if not anything else. So for example, this company was designing a tower with the sun in the background. I think it was for some kind of uh, Japanese company or something. I don't remember which company. but. It was for a company that wanted to show a golden tower with the sun in the background. But when you look at it for the first time, it looks like the behind of a fat woman sitting on a thumbstack or a pin or something. They could have at least made the you know, towers straight. So it, it was a poorly designed ad because it wasn't conveying what it was trying to convey. Now, bad logos. This one is about you know, logos about people trying to shake hands or be friendly. This one is, I think, about a dentist who is uh, trying to treat a patient on the dental table. But it sure looks like some kind of sexual harassment is going on or something. And it doesn't really convey what it's trying to convey. So you have to put a lot of thought into all this while designing ads. And this is supposed to represent childcare. This was for Arlington Pediatric Center and this is for from some other center, they're trying to say that your children will be very safe with us. They're trying to portray an adult, you know, being very kind and loving towards a child. But this sure looks like a pedophile. So whoever designed these logos didn't put enough thought into what they were doing. This is about a consumer store that's supposed to be the picture of a mouse, but it sure looks like a certain part of the human anatomy. And this is again some logos gone wrong. So this is supposed to be a baker's hat on a bakery. But it again looks like it's a part of a human anatomy. So whoever was designing these logos didn't put enough thought into them. That picture is supposed to represent the two uh, kind of domes of a mosque. It's for some Islamic understanding institute. But I think it doesn't really convey what it's trying to. And this is about a child, children's playground or some kind of a kindergarten. But 
we're not sure what the kids are doing in there in that logo. It it's not a very well designed logo. Sometimes the way the text is aligned, the way the font is used can also misrepresent what the logo is trying to say. Now this is about Megaflex, but the way the L is written next to the I, it looks like something else. So, and this one is supposed, to, this advertisement, the logo is for a safe place. It's like a place where people and children are safe and somebody is hugging you making them look safe. This looks like a monster or a gorilla trying to like squeeze a child or something. It looks like scary. It looks anything but safe. So you need to put a lot of thought into advertising. So let's talk about what career options in marketing you can pursue. So you did an MBA in marketing. The courses are actually quite easy. And in fact, most people had straight A's. I had all, almost all straight A's in uh, marketing. It is actually one of the easiest subjects to study in an MBA. That's not just what I think, but it's what almost everyone thinks. But to actually become a marketing manager or like the chief marketing officer and run effective campaigns and you know perform consumer psycholo psychological analysis and get the product to be successful is a very complex game. I mean, it's, it requires more than just intelligence. It requires you to be sensitive and have a lot of uh, awareness of the product and a lot of positive attitude too. Like for example, uh, there was this um, case study like, there was this company that made shoes and they sent their, one of their sales rep to a country I think like in Africa and they said, go check out the market if it's good over there and we gotta go like, check out if we can venture uh, and sell our shoes and footwear in this market. So the guy goes to this really poor place and he studies them and he sees nobody even knows what footwear is. Nobody wears shoes or slippers. And he comes back and says, hey, the marketplace is really bad. Nobody even knows what it is and I don't think we can communicate with them or sell this, this is not gonna work. Another company sell, sends you know, their sales rep to study the same marketplace and he comes back, he sees the same thing and he comes back and says, hey, you know what? The market's really great. Nobody even knows what footwear is and nobody knows what shoes are. We can tell them how nice they are and how you know useful shoes and slippers are. We sell them initially at low price and then make our entry there. This is a phenomenal great marketplace. We can they don't know what it is and they're gonna love this. So there are two ways of looking at situations and there's actually a third way, that's the realistic way. Neither optimistic nor pessimistic, but realistic. And marketing helps you, you know, get a realistic picture of how your products are likely to sell and what kind of products you got to develop. So after you do an MBA in marketing, you can become a product manager. So a product manager is essentially someone who conceptualizes and designs how products must work. So he has to consider various products and people's psychology and even if it's like an IT project being implemented in an organization, suppose they're implementing a CRM, like Salesforce CRM, Customer Relationship Management. So suppose they have to implement the help desk module. Suppose they have to implement a field service module. Suppose they have to implement a module where they're developing uh, contracts with the customers. So they have to think about how the customer really rel relates to this service and this offering and how best they should tailor the product for the customer. And then a product manager has to think about various factors in designing the product and its functionality and features. A marketing manager is one who runs the marketing campaigns, does the surveys, the consumer psychology, and then the marketing manager decides how to take the product to market, when to launch it. So, you know, when to launch a product is also very important. For example, there was another interesting case study, like, you know, Victoria's Secret, they produced lingerie, and um, they introduced a new women's product. And they had a big fashion show, I think it was the water bra, and then they introduced this product, launched it big, and then it became very, you know, popular. And um, so, uh, everybody was excited about it. But then, at the launch, there were all these competitors. and. I think Walmart 
copied the idea and you know Victoria's Secret was probably planning to sell this product at sixty dollars per piece but Walmart introduced the same or similar piece at like fourteen dollars so everyone almost went to Walmart so you have to think about when to launch it so that people don't you know sabotage your prospects there is something called a first mover advantage so if you if your product is not the best if you are the first to introduce it some people will come to you that's the first mover advantage and then there is a business analyst so you can become a business analyst after you do an MBA in marketing so in like an IT project software project the business owner the product owners they know all about how their business works and stuff they don't know how to translate it into technical specifications how to implement it in using a software like Salesforce or PeopleSoft or SAP. So a business analyst or a business systems analyst sometimes, they help translate business requirements. They educate the product owners. They tell them, hey look, I know you want to do it this way, but in this software, there is already an out-of-the-box functionality which helps you do 80% of what you're trying to do. If you just use this out-of-the-box, does this work? If you want to do some minimal configuration, this is the level of effort it takes and this is the outcome you get. But if you want to do like heavy customization, this is the level of effort it takes and this is the outcome you get. So they have to educate them about the pros and cons, how to do it. And then they translate the business requirements into technical specifications for the developers to develop. So a business analyst is like a liaison between the business team and the technical team. It's a very interesting and challenging role. You can also become a business development manager. A business development manager is someone who looks into uh, like sales and uh, developing the business of the company in different target markets. BCM is responsible for revenue generation and closing deals and sales. A pre-sales analyst. Pre-sales analyst tries to, you know, demonstrate the product to the customers and uh, make them see the value in the products and convince them to buy the product. So. It's about demonstrating, showcasing products to customers, uh, developing proof of concepts, making it work for them. Chief marketing officer. A chief marketing officer is like, like you know, you have the CEO, CTO, CFO, COO, which is like chief executive officer, uh, chief operating officer, chief technical officer, technological officer, and then there's, um, uh, you know, uh, chief financial officer. They also have positions like the chief marketing officer. So after becoming a product owner, a marketing manager, director of marketing, VP of marketing, you can actually become a chief marketing officer. So if you realize that marketing is what you really want to do, you can actually scale up the path in this way. But if you do an MBA in marketing, you can actually apply it in various ways, in sales, in pre-sales, in business analysis, product development, uh, product management, you can brand management, advertising, you can look at various career options. Marketing is very interesting and the courses are kind of easy. And um, if you would like to study marketing, I promise you it will be very interesting. So uh, I hope that gives you an insight about what an MBA in marketing is all about. And when you go to do your MBA, you don't really have to major in any particular field. You can take some courses in marketing, some in finance, some in HR, some in entrepreneurship. But then if you want to get like an MBA in marketing, you have to take about, I think, five or six courses in marketing itself. So that's uh, all about MBA in marketing. I gave you a good idea of what you're likely to study in an MBA in marketing. And it's good to be well informed. So when you go there, you can decide what courses you want to take and what not. If you don't want to be a product manager or you don't want to really do marketing after your MBA, this is going to be a waste if you waste all your time studying marketing courses. And some of these courses are easy. You can study them by yourself. If you would rather spend that time studying entrepreneurship or finance, well, you got to make a conscious choice by being well informed ahead of time. So, good luck and make a decision about what you would like to major in in your